Okay. So the first person we're gonna talk about tonight is Franklin P. Adams. And one of, one of the things I say on my tours is you, the round table is not just the people that are in the Al Hirschfeld drawing or the painting that's in the Algonquin Hotel, which are the same exact people. Um, there's not 10 members of the round table, there's 30 members. And the other 20 that you don't know so much about, which I, I talked about in my book, um, the Algonquin Round Table in New York, which I just showed on the screen. Um, those people to me um, have wonderful stories, they have fantastic um, histories, and they were really fun to research. But the other thing is, for some of the other roundtable members, like Adams, who was very, very popular in his time, he's out of print. And if he's remembered for anything today, it's for writing, it's for writing uh, baseball sad lexicon um, about uh, Tinker's Evers and Chance in 1909, the immortal baseball poem. But he is so much more than just that one poem um, that he has hundreds, if not thousands of poems that have been written and he's out of print. So what I'd like to do on tonight's talk is talk about him and another poet because today, ding, 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 is the beginning of National, National Poetry Month. And so I wanna focus on two poets tonight and in the succeeding weeks, gonna do this every Wednesday in April, um, focus on other people that you might have heard their names, you might not have heard their names, but um, I wanna shine a little light on some of them and bring some of their, um, some of their writings back to uh, the forefront. And maybe one of you guys will get one of their books and or write a play about them or a book about them or something like that. So let me tell you a little about Adams and then we're gonna get into a little bit about um, what he wrote. So I have a brief introduction that he was New York's most popular newspaper columnist for two generations and the Dean of the Round Table was Franklin P. Adams. For close to 40 years, his columns were fixtures in New York. Uh, in the newspapers, his readers knew him as FPA. Um, he was born Franklin Adams. He added the P to have um, a three letter initial to go into newspapers. And some say it was for Pierce, but it's kind of up in the air. It wasn't a real name. Um, Adams accepted submissions contributed by his readers. He called them contribs. And landing in FPA's column was a coup. Among those that he published earlier in their careers, or before they even had them, were George S. Kaufman, James Thurber, Edna St. Vincent Millay, Deems Taylor, and E.B. White. He also published scores of poems by Dorothy Parker, including her most famous pieces like Resume and News Items. And she said, he raised me from a couplet. My next slide. Oh, hang on here. So Adams was born in Chicago uh, on November, November 15th, 1881, the son of a dry goods merchant. Um, he spent one year at the University of Michigan, then left to go home to take care of his family following the death of his father. And he had a short stint in the Chicago insurance business, um, but he landed a job at the Chicago Mail where he started his first column. But he's itching to leave town and go to New York. He had his eye on a pretty actress named Minna Schwartz, Two years a senior, his kindly editor wrote to the managing editor of the New York Evening Mail, and a position was secured. Adams was 22 when he landed in Manhattan. Adams became a star writing his first column, Always in Good Humor, for the Evening Mail, an afternoon paper locked in a circulation war with other dailies. Soon after, Adams changed his column name to the Conning Tower for the armored pilot house on battleships, and the Conning Tower was the name he stuck with for the rest of his career, 40 years in New York. His readers knew that he would sprinkle in his columns of what he was doing, where he went, whom he lost to at tennis, and what his wife said. Thousands of readers knew of his home life, his cat, his meals, and shows he attended. Um, so FPA was crazy for playing tennis, and this is one of the, and he, he was also a lifelong um, member of the Forest Hills Tennis Club, so he was always going out there writing about tennis. And that's a picture of him in his army uniform from World War I. Newspaper Row. So um, to give you your geography lesson, um, this is where Pace University is. Um, that's City Hall Park in the foreground. On the left um, with, the, with the dome is the Pulitzer Building. So that's the world. 
That was demolished in the 1950s for an entranceway to um, the, the uh, Brooklyn Bridge, which is behind all these buildings. The World is a very small building right in the middle. And that's the Tribune, a gorgeous, gorgeous building that was demolished um, in 1968. Um, the Tribune and the Times. And so the Times uh, building is still around. It's being used um, by Pace University. Um, he left the Tribune in 1921 for the world. So look, he just walked right across the street. Um, and by then the Algonquin Roundtable was in full swing and FPA was the senior member. In 1919, FPA was living with Minna at 603 West on 11th Street uh, near Columbia. FPA served in the Army in World War I. He earned a commission as a captain. In Paris, he worked on Stars and Stripes. This is where the Roundtable started. The Roundtable started when they started getting together in Paris during World War I. With two other future members of the Roundtable, Harold Ross and Alexander Wolcott, not long after the three returned from France, the Roundtable began in June 1919. In 1924, FPA divorced Minna, shocking his readers who had read about his personal life for almost 20 years. He took a five month break from his column. Uh, Frank Sullivan pinched it for him and that's one of the things that made Frank Sullivan so famous. And on May 9th, 1925 in Greenwich, he married Esther Sales Root. That's her right there. She was several years his junior. Uh, she was a friend of Edna St. Vincent Millay. She introduced them. And um, they went on to have four kids. And that's his apartment. I have thousands of pictures. And so I'm really happy to be able to show you the pictures of his apartment. Um, the couple had four kids, three sons and a daughter. And by 1928, he lived with his growing family at 124 West 13th Street, which is where this picture is. And later they reside at 26 West 10th Street. E.B. White, that was the picture that I showed you at the beginning, said, I used to walk past his house and the block seemed to tremble the way Park Avenue trembles when a train leaves Grand Central. FP and his family reloaded, relocated to Connecticut during the depression. But the only thing that kept him afloat was a radio job he secured on CBS on the quiz show Information Please. This, these are both in Connecticut. Um, and the Ferber was a core member of the round table. She visited many, many times. That's a Franklin automobile, that's super trivia. <laughs> he loved Franklin's made in upstate New York. And that's her old Ross. Um, so the funny thing about this picture is both Ross and FPA were in the army together. However, Ross was a private, he had to carry FPA's bags and FPA was a captain. So then the roles were reversed and after um, FPA fell on hard times, Ross added him to the payroll of the New Yorker for the rest of his life. The twilight of Franklin Piam's life and career was painfully sad. In a matter of a few years, he lost his newspaper job, his radio show, and his marriage. To make matters worse, um, he was afflicted with probably undiagnosed Alzheimer's disease. Uh, Harold Ross was an army buddy on the payroll, and after World War II, things got hard. Um, FPA was a member of the Players, and uh, he moved into the Players, um, but they didn't really like that because he was kind of um, not well. Um, Esther divorced him. She sold the family home in Connecticut, and FPA had nowhere to go. So he was living at the Players, and in his last year of his life, he was spent in a nursing home on 102nd Street on the Upper West Side. Aside from his ex-wife and children, he received almost no visitors. He died on March 23rd, 1960. He was 78. Um, these are his kids, um, Persephone. Um, that was a name suggested by Edna St. Vincent Millay. Uh, Tim, Jonathan, and Tony. And that's Tony with me a few years ago, at his house in Connecticut. Um, he is one of the last survivors of the children of a round table member. He's sharp as a tack and really, really fantastic. Uh, great, great gentleman. Does anybody have any questions so far? Any questions so far? Let me see our... No, thank you. Checking out the, the chat window coming in. All right. So one of the things about the, the writers we're going to talk about tonight, and here are some of um, FPA's books. Um, he has about a dozen books out. Um, they're all out of print. Um, and you can find these on eBay for a couple of dollars. I just looked today, there's even some signed first editions you can get for not a lot of money. Um, and 
the reason he had so many books is he wrote so many words. Um, he was writing a column six days a week uh, for almost 40 years, so he was creating a lot of content. And if you know Dorothy Parker's poems, you'll see that she mimicked his style almost to the T. So he wrote ballads, sonics, and classical styles of pretty much the English form of poetry. He did not go in for a free verse. He was a classically trained uh, poet. What he was writing about was New York. So let me read you a few of these before we go on to our next, our next guy. So Tobogganing and Panassus, great book. Parnassus, oh my gosh, my Greek teacher would kill me for that. This is from 1912. So this is, um, he wrote a lot of song lyrics too. And if you, I'll share um, someplace on one of my websites, I have a song he wrote um, that uh, Jerome Kern wrote the music for called um, Keep Your Rabbits Rabbi. We have uh, rabbits of our own, which is my friend Bill Zephro recorded. It's a very funny song. So he wrote a lot of songs. Um, he also wrote a musical um, with O. Henry, if you can believe that one. Um, this is called, this is good for these times. It's called I Cannot Pay That Premium. Beside a frugal table, though spotless, clean, and white, a loving couple they did sit and all seemed pleasant quite. They did not have no servant the things away to take, for he was but a broker who much money did not make. This says key change to minor. He lit a 50 cent cigar and then his wife did say, your life insurance, it will lapse if it, you do not pay. He turned from her in sorrow for breaking was his heart and in a mezzo baritone to her did say, in part, I cannot pay the premium, I'll have to let it go. It fills me with remorse and sorrow, not to mention woe. Though I'm quite strong and healthy and will outlive you perhaps, I cannot pay that premium, I'll have to let it lapse. <laughs> the wife she not did answer for a cutter to the quick, she washed the dishes, filled the lamp, and likewise trimmed the wick. She took in washing the next day and played bridge whist all night until she had enough to pay her husband's premium quite. The husband, he was thrown next day from his automobile and although rather lonesome, it did make his widow feel. It made her glad to know that she'd paid that premium and oftentimes in her after years, these words she'd awfully hum, I cannot pay that premium, I'll have to let it go. It filled me with remorse and sorrow, not to mention woe. That's the first one. So in 1914, he came out with By and Large, another collection of his previously published pieces. I have one out of here. Um, he wrote a lot of ballads. So here's a ballad, it's called Ballad of Girls Who Attend the Princeton Yale and Yale Harvard Football Games. And in parentheses he says, written after years of close observations at the games and the bleak intervals between them. This is the way it appears to me every season, as I recall, every season I seem to see fairest of maidens, one and all. Watching the colleges play football and the Vox Humana me explains, where do you tarry from fall to fall? Where do you hide between the games? Whence is beauty of such degree and number so much as to appall? I seek in vain for a smile, fairest of maidens, one and all. Where do you vanish? Behind what wall? Where are your houses and where are your hames? Slaves are you to some witch's thrall? Where do you hide between the games? I gaze and gaze at the bourgeoisie, I find the play or the concert hall, but the total never sums up to be fairest of maidens, one and all. I may see one of from an opera stall or a star from one of the, or a star from one of the melodrames, but the annual average is sadly small. Where do you hide between the games? Princesses, pardon my simple scrawl, fairest of maidens, one and all, but who, who are you and what are your names? Where do you hide between the games? That's a guy that never went to the Ivy League. Okay, so 1920 was a very good book. This is something else again, because this contains a lot of the things that he wrote um, during World War I. Like I said, I just wrote a World War I book, um, but it's also when he was in France with the AEF. And so there's a few that have a tie to the Great War. He also loved Horace, so he does a lot of mimics of Horace. This is called The Doughboy's Horace, and it's, it's two people. So this is Horace, private in the infantry 
American Expeditionary Forces writes, while I was fussing you at home, you put the notion in my dome that I was the molasses kid. I batted strong, I'll say I did. Lydia, Anyberg, USA writes, while you were fussing me alone, the other boys, my heart was stone. When I was all that you could see, no girl had anything on me. Horace, well, say, I'm having some romance with one Babette of Northern France. If that girl gave me the command, I'd dance a jig in no man's land. Lydia, I too have got a young affair with Charlie. Say, that boy is there. I'd just as soon go and die if I thought it'd please that guy. Horace, suppose I can this foreign wren and start things up with you again. Suppose I promise to be good. I'd love you, Lyd, I'll say I would. Lydia, though Charlie's good and handsome, oh boy, and you're a stormy fickle doughboy, go give the hunt his final whack and I'll marry you when you come back. Here's another one uh, that he wrote in France. Just a couple more. When you meet a man from your own hometown, sing, O Muse, in the treble clef, a little song of the AEF. And pardon me, please, if I give vent to something akin to sentiment. But we have our moments over here. We want to cry and we want to cheer. And the hurrah feeling will not down when you meet a man from your own hometown. It's many a lonesome, longsome day since you embarked from the USA and you met some men, it's great big war, from towns you never had known before. And you landed here and your rest camp mate was a man from some strange and distant state. Liked him, yes, but you wanted to see a man from the town where he used to be. And then you went by design or chance all over the well-known map of France. And you yearned with a yearn that grew and grew to talk with a man from the burg you knew. In some lugubrious morning when your morale is batting about 110, where are you from? And you make reply, and the OD warrior says, so am I. The, uni the universe wears a smiling face as you spill your talk of the old home place. You talk of the streets and the hometown jokes, and you find that you know each other's folks, and you have any more woes at all as you both decide that the world is small. A statement adding to its renown when you meet a man from your own hometown. You may be among the enlisted men, you may be a lieutenant or a major gen. Your home may be up in the Chilkoot Pass in Denver, Colorado or in Pittsburgh, Ma Pittsfield, Mass. You may have come from Chicago, Illinois, Buffalo, Portland or Louisville, but there's nothing I'm gambling can keep you down when you meet a man from your own hometown. If you want to know why I wrote this poem, well, I've just had a talk with a guy from home. And one more. Uh, let's skip that one. This one is So There, which is one of the last collections of his original verse from 1923. This is a short one called Lullaby. If my dear, you seek to slumber, count of stars, an endless number. If you still continue wakeful, count the drops that make a lakeful. Then if vigilance yet above you, hover count the times I love you. And if slumber still repel you, count the times I do not tell you. So we did do a few love poems. So the last one I'm gonna read from FPA is an answer poem. And he did a lot of these where he'd write in the style of other writers. And I just came across this this afternoon when I was doing my prep for this. And this is about John V.A. Weaver, who is the next person we'll be talking about. And Johnny Weaver uh, wrote in American ease. He was known as the slang poet. And so um, FPA is mimicking Johnny Weaver's style, which we're about to find out about in a, about a minute and a half. So in American was the debut of uh, Weaver's poetry and it was a smash success. And so FPA is gonna do an answer poem back and it's called On In American by John V. A. Weaver. Last night I read this book, O oh Johnny Weavers. Some little book it is, I'll tell the world. Some writing goof he is, I'll say he is. 
The name of this here book is In American. Now make me, this here weaver, hear me telling ye, has got it over lots of writing birds. He says a faithful, and he says it straight. Lays off the mush, the hokum, if you get me. None of this heart of gold beneath a rough outside. This is weaver's guys, talk regular talk. His jeans get off the chatter like they spill. To me, and unless you kid yourself, say, listen, if this weaver was a frog, ear if he come a lecturing from London, you'd yelp your nut off. Ain't the fellow quaint? His stuff is, like they say, say from out of the soil. Too bad America ain't got no writers. What do you mean too bad? You make me sick. So on that, we're gonna move on to our next person for the evening, uh, Johnny Weaver. And um, raise your hand if you guys have ever heard of John Weaver or have read any of his stuff. I don't see any hands going up. <laughs> oh, we have one. We have one. All right, so let me uh, share my screen. All right. John Weaver, look at that handsome guy. Um, he, it's, it's really tragic how, how out of fashion he's fallen and um, how he's out of print. And because at one time he was a, a major, major a poet and really well known and his books were, were really bestsellers. Uh, let me give you a little introduction about John V.A. Weaver. If Dorothy Parker was the reigning wit of the vicious circle, then John V.A. Weaver was her polar opposite sitting on the other side of the table. Both were the same age. Both wrote poetry, short stories, criticism, plays, and screenplays. Yet Parker's remembered for being the quotable good time girl, while Weaver, who had a greater output and a modicum of fame, isn't remembered for anything. Johnny Weaver is cursed with being a footnote to the history of the vicious circle Yet he married a fellow member, actress Peggy Wood, and was friendly with the whole group. In less than 10 years, Weaver went from being an unknown poet to the screenwriter who put words into silent screen superstar. Um, Clara wrote, um, um, wait, I got a mistake here. I got to fix this. Not Clara Bow. It was, uh, Louise Brooks. Boy, if I said, <laughs> if I got Louise Brooks misspelled with Clara Bow, I'd be in big trouble. Weaver was born July 17th, 1893 in Charlotte, North Carolina to John Val Eston Weaver and Ann Randolph Weaver. He grew up in Winnetka, Illinois. He went to Hamilton College in upstate New York and graduated in 1914. His Hamilton classmate, Carl Carmer said, John Weaver had impact, meeting him meant feeling the smack of personality. Weaver had an inquisitive mind, practically no tact, and an embarrassing directness. So being direct was always uh, his hallmark throughout his career. Weaver went to Harvard for one semester after leaving, Hamilton, after leaving Hamilton before moving to Chicago to write advertising copy and book reviews for the Daily News. From 1917 to 1919, he served stateside of the Army or Ordnance Corps in, uh, in Georgia. A turning point in Weaver's life was when he read uh, H.L. Mencken's book, The American Language, and took issue with the Baltimore pundits assertion that writing and slang could not be taken seriously and that real writers did not use the language of the streets. Weaver wrote to him in protest whereupon Mencken challenged Weaver if he thought it could be done to go and try it. Weaver's response was sent an elegy American in 1919, which we're gonna hear in just a minute. Mencken loved it and sent Weaver $11.25 to publish it in the smart set, a leading literary magazine of the era. This attracted the attention of publisher Alfred A. Knopf, who asked a 27-year-old if, if he had enough material for a book, and In American came out in 1921. It was a bestseller going through seven printings in the first year. This is during his Hollywood era. I love that uh, hairstyle. In 1920, Weaver moved to New York and was immediately befriended by Wolcott, also an alumnus from Hamilton. Wolcott had a soft spot for those who graduated from the small school in upstate New York and landed in the city. Wolcott brought the aspiring poet to the Algonquin and introduced him to the table. Weaver's star quickly rose and literary critics tabbed him as the man who wrote in the American language. As early as 1921, Weaver was mentioned in the same literary columns as Sherwood Anderson, Theodore Dreiser, and Eugene O'Neill. 
From 1920 to 24, Weaver held a day job as literary editor of the Brooklyn Daily Eagle, working alongside other roundtable members, Ruth Hale and Bill Murray. It was during that time that Weaver, while a member of the roundtable, wrote some of his best poetry. Weaver's other books of verse were Finders in 1923, More in America in 1926, To Youth 1927, and Turning Point in 1930. He also wrote fiction as well, and he has a couple of uh, uh, novels out. Glad I have Louise Brooks up there and not Clara Bow, or I never hear the end of it. In 1926, Clara with George Abbott to write a comedy, Love Him and Leave Him, which was a sole Broadway hit. It's based on a poem that's in one of his first books and ran for 200 performances. Critics called him the slang poet. He wrote like an American. The play was turned into a hit movie that same year, starring 19-year-old Louise Brooks in one of her first parts. I think it might've been her first talking part. Weaver then went to Hollywood to write for King Vider. The crowd was among his films for the director. However, the work didn't fulfill Weaver and he earned less than a dozen screenplay credits in the era of early talking pictures. So this is his wife. So Peggy Wood was also a round table member. She was from Brooklyn. Um, she had a 60 year Broadway career. Um, if, she, if she's remembered for anything today is she was the mother abbess in The Sound of Music uh, in 1968, I believe it was, nominated for an Academy Award. Uh, Weaver met Peggy Wood at the Algonquin. Uh, that's not Weaver, that's uh, a Broadway show called The Clinging Vine. Um, Wood tried to charm Weaver, who had just published an anti-love poem in Vanity Fair. The trick worked and they started a secret romance that lasted more than two years. While Wood continued acting and Weaver writing, the pair was often separated. The stress of separation even caused Wood to lose her voice. The couple were married during the cruise to Hamilton, Bermuda on Valentine's Day, 1924. Wood went to Broadway and Weaver worked at the Brooklyn Daily Eagle as a literary editor. This is their house on Montague Street, one of the most beautiful streets in all of New York City. They reside at 68 Montague Street in Brooklyn Heights after they were married. Um, Wood joked that now that she was back in Brooklyn after making it on Broadway. Uh, they had a son, David, um, not too long after their marriage, and a year after the wedding, they bought property in rural Stamford, Connecticut. A lot of the roundtable members uh, lived in the Stamford area, including Ross and uh, FPA. Uh, here's their house. Um, tragically, not long after their only child was born, Weaver contracted tuberculosis. Gravely ill, he left Los Angeles and moved to Colorado, where he thought the mountain air would help. When he went west, his condition worsened, and he got quite ill in early 1938. His doctors sent him to Colorado Springs to recover. Wood was in London, appearing in Noel Coward's hit, Operette. He died on June 14, 1938. He was a month shy of turning 45. Five weeks after Weaver's death, his widow arrived in New York aboard the Queen Mary, I'm gonna talk about that in just a minute. Um, so what happened is after his death, um, uh, after his death, let me go to the gallery view here. After his death, um, Peggy Wood collected all of his work and that went into this book in America, the collected uh, verse and poems of John V.A. Weaver which is really great and has all the greatest hits. Um, and it's well worth getting and you can find copies of it um, really well. And then she traveled the country going to colleges, uh, performing his work and doing readings of his work for many years. And a few years later, she remarried to somebody in the public uh, printing business or something like that. Um, but let's talk about some of the things that he wrote. So he is completely different than FPA, completely different. I mean, they couldn't night and day because he wrote in free verse. And um, he wrote in the American vernacular and he tried to speak like people really talked. And so this is uh, from a woman's point of view called Elegy American. I wished I took the ring, not the Victrola. You get so tired of records, hearing them and hearing them. And when a person don't have much to spend, they feel they shouldn't have, ought to be so wasteful. And then these warm nights make it slow inside and sitting lovely down by the lake where him and me would always used to go. He thought the Vic make it, it easier without him 
And I did it first. I'd play some jazz band music and I'd almost feel his arms around me dancing after that. I turn out the lights and sat there quiet while Alma Gluck was singing Home Sweet Home, almost know his hand was stroking my hand. If I was you, I'd take the Vic, he says. It's something you can use. You can't, a ring. Wish I, had a, uh, wish I had ways to make a record for you so I could be right with you even though Uncle Sam had me. Now I'm glad he didn't. It would be lots too much like seeing ghosts now that I'm sure he never won't be coming back. Oh God, I don't see how I ever stand it. He was so big and strong, he was a darb. The swellest dresser with them nifty shirts that folded down and them lovely knobby shoes and always all his clothes would be one color like green socks with green ties and a green hat and everything. We never had no words or hardly none. And now to think that mouth I used to kiss is biting into dirt and through them curls I used to smooth, a bullet has went. I wished it would have killed me too. Oh well, about the Vic, I guess I'll sell it. And get a small ring anyways. I won't get but a half as good as one as if he spent all on that first one when he had when he first asked me. It don't even seem right to play jazz tunes no more with him gone, and it ain't a likely chance I'd find nobody ever else again would suit me, or I'd suit. And so a little quarter of a carrot maybe, but a real one that I could sparkle sometimes and remember the home I should have had. And still, you know, the Vic was his, his idea, and so I wonder. Here is a shorter one it's called In Love. In love, you tell me, I'm in love again. So he's a regular doll, some boy chum. Oh, I'm wild about him. And go on, so the way you always rave about your men. In love, the nerve. Why, only just last week, it was a Jackie. And the week before, that Willie boy down to the dry goods store. You make me sick so I can hardly speak. Why, when love hits you, everything's a dream. It's like you took some dope and nothing seems real. Except one face you just can't help but see. Waking or sleeping, all the time you scheme. How you could help him, work or lie or steal, die even, and you squawk in love to me. Okay, I have two more to tell you guys. So look at the title of this one. Is it reversed? It's called Died of Influenza. I mean, it couldn't be more appropriate than right now. Push the screen back just a little more so as I can hear him playing to the color. Wish I could see the boys clicking their heels smart, all glad and clean, neat for retreat after the day's sweat. Here's me in bed. God, what a joke. Me that wanted to fight knowing I got a croak. Don't kid me, Doc. The head's burning up. I know, Doc. I know. I left my job six bucks a day. Expert lathe hand, that was me. I told him I hated the Dutch and wanted to carry a gun. Drill, drill, drilled, gets hard as nails, and then an order come. Expert lathe hand, Richard H. Jones, transferred at once. So I come here down to the audience core, me that wanted to fight. They give me, they take my gun, gives me a shovel. Audience core, right? All my buddies gone, scrap it overseas, me left to watch, watch, and dig latrines. Jones, lathe hand, what the bloomin' hell, says, so the steel says, no place for you just yet, or what, just wait a while. Here's a shovel, a shovel, Jones. You do your bit. Dig, Jones, dig. That's the way it is. Me that wanted to fight. Stuck in a hole here. Dig. Goddamn latrines. Good old army, huh? Still, I suppose somebody knows what's the big idea. And I guess a guy can fight for what he loves and do his damn bit. Yeah, and die for it, even with a shovel. So the last poem I'm going to read tonight is probably his most famous after... Uh, American Elegy. And he wrote this uh, when he wasn't even 40. And maybe he knew he had tuberculosis, maybe he didn't. I don't know. I'd love to know how long he knew he had TB. Um, it's called When I'm All Through. And if you remember what I said that um, when Peggy Wood got off the Queen Mary, the press was waiting for her, it's because she had been out of the U.S. the entire time her husband was, was deceased. And everybody knew about this poem, which was published with his obituary, uh, When I'm All Through. When I'm all through and you got to get rid of me, don't go shooting the bunk or making prayers and all that stuff. And don't go sticking me into no stuffy cemetery lot. I want some room 
I got to have room, I got to go. So if you really want to take the trouble, you take what's left and put it in a fire, the hottest you can find and let her burn till ain't only a handful of gray something, ashes to ashes, ain't that a whole lot cleaner than dust to dust? You left, you let old fire have me. Then you just cut them ashes in four parts. Take the first ashes to the side of a mountain. Heave them up to the wind. I used to love the way it's quiet and strong and big up there. The second ashes, take them down to the ocean. And when the waves come piling up the beach, scatter them where the green starts to get foamy. They used to sing me songs about having nerve and never getting tired or giving in. Let them run and take me with them. And the third part, you go out to the country into some wide long field and spread them around. Maybe they'll help the grass to climb a little. I can remember how I used to roll and dig my face down in and sniff and bite it and lay back on it just a crazy kid and watch the cows go skipping over the sky and the bees and the crazy birds and everything would get so perfect, I would want to cry. Then there'll be one part left. You take that down where there's the thickest crowds right in the city. And when nobody's looking, give it a sling onto the sidewalk underneath their feet. The poor things always hoofing it along. Somewheres they don't know nowhere, and I don't either. Always looking for something. Wonder what. I never got very near him. A person can't. Even when you want to. Everybody's scared. So scared, you know. So scared. But a bunch of acid, but a bunch of ashes. Maybe might get real close to somebody once, just once. So when Peggy Wood stepped off that boat, what did she say to the press? Wood said the four parts of the ashes, as called for in his 1926 poem, would be spread on a hill near their home in Stamford, a sunny field near South Stamford, and the ocean spot would be in Santa Monica, where they had shared many happy times. For the last part, she needed a busy avenue. When I do, she said, no one will see me. I will be alone. And she never said where she spread them. So those are our two people tonight, everybody. Um, does anybody have any questions? Comments? Uh, I have a question. Sure. You know, um, when FPA was salaried by the New Yorker at that time, was he actually submitting anything or was Harold Ross just being really nice and giving him money? He was just on the payroll. Yeah, right. They called him the comma hunter of Park Row. Mm -hmm. So he wasn't really an official part of the staff. He was just on the payroll so he could get right. insurance, the health insurance. Um, and that continued, you know, Ross died in 1951 mm -hmm. and FPA died in 1960. And so uh, William Sean, his successor, kept him on the payroll even after that. Oh, wow. Yeah, I was mean, reading the... Um the year with Ross, Thurber's biography, you know, it sounds like he gave Thurber a lot of, at least, uh, <clears throat> you know, forwarded cash to pay for a lot of his surgeries and things like that. So it sounds like something that Ross would do. I wonder if he even uh, humored him by having him contribute anything at all. You think not, just he was totally given the money just to help him survive. Well, you know, you know, Ross was a complex person. He was very, very complex, but he had a deep love for FPA because you know, he met him when he was in his early 20s in, in Paris when he was a private, he was a nobody. And so, you know, FPA was, was very loyal to him and treated him very well and he never forgot that. Um, if you read um, what Jane Grant wrote in uh, Ross, The New Yorker and Me, she's also very kind to FPA as well too. Interesting. Well, thank you. Anybody else? Anything from Kathy? No, thank you. Well, one of the things that um, I can say, because I, I, I'm not sure if I'll do a, a, a Peggy Wood night. Um, she was a, a great reader, a writer too. Her father was a magazine editor um, who wrote for 50 years and she inherited that talent. Um, she wrote a book about uh, John Drew, the Barrymore's uncle. Um, she wrote, I think, two autobiographies, um, and she wrote a lot of magazine articles. When she became famous on television for um, uh, this playing Mama on a long-running TV serial, uh, soap opera, 
she became very famous. And so she started writing even more magazine pieces. Um, but she, um, she, she wrote a lot about that the era and those folks. And um, so she kind of continued on the, the thing uh, of, of literature. When she died in a nursing home in 1978 in, uh, in Connecticut, and um, they did a clean out of her house and it all went to the local public library. She had thousands of books. And they found out um, when they got to the library and they were just dumped there, they're all signed first editions. Dreiser, Sherwood Anderson, Fitzgerald, Hemingway, everybody that they were friends with, she had all of their books and they just got dumped. Uh, I never found out where she's interred. I, of all the 30 roundtable members, I think there's only about five people. I never found their um, final resting place. And so maybe she was cremated and ashes spread someplace like her husband was too. I, I don't really know. Anybody else? Um, I have a question. Can sure. you hear me? Yes. Uh, you said that a lot of the uh, members of the round table lived around the Stanford area. Uh, would you happen to know if any of them lived in Darien? Wow, you're going to get me on my Southern Connecticut um, geography here. Um, uh -huh. I'm not. I'm not sure. A lot of them were around uh, Stanford, Litchfield County. Um, um, how far is Darien from? Uh, uh, it's right it, next it, to Stanford. It's right next to Stanford. Oh yeah, they were, they were very close. Um, Ross lived there. Um, I have Ross's address in my book. Uh, Haywood Brun and Ruth Hale. Um, they had a house um, not too far in Stanford. Um, and then Murdoch Pemberton lived with them for many years until Brun got remarried and he got kicked out. Um, Jane Grant and her second husband um, they moved to Litchfield County and started a white flower farm, which is still around today. You can get a Jane Grant rhododendron. Um, yeah. So it, it seemed like a lot of them went to either um, uh, Connecticut um, or Long Island. And so there was a few that are on Long Island uh, in uh, Nassau County. In that the makes sense. Yeah. Thank yeah, you. But, but, you know, the New York Central went right there. So you could get in pretty quickly. Anybody else? Well, um, if you're around on Friday at two, I'm going to do my Algonquin Roundtable walking tour um, from your couch. So I've adapted that tour to um, cover about 30 places the roundtable went. I have tons of pictures, tons of stuff to show off, including this. This is a brick from the Algonquin Hotel. I have a crazy collection of stuff. You have no idea. I have boxes and boxes of stuff. So when the hotel was going through its renovation in 2012, the GM at the time, Gary Blood, said, do you want to come in? I was like, of course I do. So I went over and put on a hard hat, and I went from the ground floor to the top floor, the 12th floor, walking up the stairs. I got to look through all the walls. They were, they did a gut renovation, and so I got one of the bricks from when they were tearing it down, tearing uh, walls out and stuff. Um, so I have that on Friday at two and Saturday at two, I'm gonna do my Dorothy Parker's tour at 2 p.m. And you can get tickets on algonquinroundtable.org and dorothyparker.com. Um, I haven't done any walking tours in New York City since uh, the first week of March when people started canceling. And now all my tours are canceled in March, April, and May. So this is what I'm doing. Um, I would love it if you guys would tell people and um, share it that we're going to do this every Wednesday. Hopefully uh, get more people next week. I have some, I have a special guest coming too. And um, everybody stay safe. Um, I really am happy you guys are able to come out tonight. It's really great. Got away from Netflix for an hour, which is really nice too. Um, thanks so much for watching and we will do this again next week. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.